God is good, is he not? Good to be in his house on a Sunday. We got a big, big series we're starting. Go ahead, grab a seat. It's good to see everybody today. You're not matching the level of excitement that I have. Got a couple things here that I'm just still set up. Little stuff, I don't need that. All right, man, it's good to be here, isn't it? Okay, for some of us, I think most of us, we remember where we were 21 years ago. How many people remember that? And that day changed a lot. And so I want to commemorate that day by reading an open letter from a woman who lost her husband. She wrote this recently. You may be aware of this situation. She wrote it to several pro golfers. It's made its way on all the social media. And that's what an open letter does. It's, it wants to go viral to inform someone of a specific issue. The issue that she brought to the attention was, why are you guys quitting the PGA to go with the Saudis have formed this new golf league, and, and we don't like it. And so I'm not making a political statement today. I'm not taking sides. My golf game ain't that good. <laughs> but I am getting to the heart of what an open letter can verbalize for each one of us. And if you're like me, my nephew, he, I mean, it's painful. He watched the events and that was it, man. He went to the military because of that. And a lot of people did that. And my uh, nephew, like many, lost his life as a result. That, that incident triggered something that he did that he died for in his mind. And so here's the letter. Let me read it to you. Dear Mesmers, Mickelson, Johnson, DeChambeau, read. My name's Terry Strada. And I write to you as a September 11th widow and mother of three children who were seven, four, and four days old when their father was brutally murdered along with nearly 3,000 other men, women, and children. At the same time, hundreds more suffered horrible long-standing injuries. Our community wishes to express our outrage at your partnership with Live Golf and remind you of the responsibility that your new business partner, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, shoulders for providing the financial support and logistical support that enabled the terrorists to attack our nation and kill our loved ones. As a freedom-loving American, I'm grateful to have the freedom of choice where I work and who I work for, and I respect that for you, your right as well. As a 9-11 widow, though, I'm compelled to help you understand the level of depravity the kingdom engaged in when it knowingly sent government agents here to establish the support network needed for those hijackers. Given Saudi Arabia's role in the death of our loved ones and those injured on 9-11, your fellow Americans, we are angered that you're so willing to help the Saudis cover up the history, this history, in their, respect, in their request for respectability. When you partner with them, you become complicit with their whitewash and help them get the reputational cover they so desperately crave and are willing to pay handsomely to manufacture. And here's the plea. Please, Rethink your membership in this Saudi enterprise. Perhaps you were unaware of what the Saudi role was in September 11, or if you were, perhaps you thought nobody would care nearly 21 years later. Either way, you were mistaken. We noticed, we care, we urge you to reconsider so that you can stand with us and send a message to the kingdom. You cannot buy respect, you must earn it sincerely. Terry Strada, National Chair, 9-11 Families United. That open letter was a plea to golfers to change their attitude and actions. There's seven open letters in the book of Revelation that are written to the church to change our attitudes and actions. That's where we're headed. That's the new series. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. I'm so excited for this series to have God speak to us. And so as soon as I say I'm going to study the book of Revelation, guess what happens? Oh, yeah, man. Come on, let's bring it out. End times, man. 
chill. <laughs> right in your Bibles. We're a Bible church. Go ahead. I mean, right in your Bibles. Right on Revelation. If you got your Bible right there, just, just, write, just write to reveal. Just write to uncover. Because that's literally what the Greek word means. It means to unveil. Revelation is not just about unveiling the chaos and the catastrophe of the end times. It's about the unveiling, the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he came to do. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and his sovereignty. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and his sufficiency. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and his supremacy. That's revelation. But that's what I'm excited about. For us as individuals, for us as a church family that are here in the room, for those of us that are watching online and are afraid of the rain, <laughs> for those of all of our locations, including St. Vincent and also in Cincinnati, extension churches, we're, we're all going to get a word from God for our churches. Okay, so look at chapter 1 for a moment, verse 19, because this is unique about Revelation. I know you guys know this because you're Bible scholars. I didn't, so let me tell a few like me. There's three parts of the book. It's broken into three parts, and you can see it in verse 19. It gives you kind of the this is the table of contents for Revelation. Right there, the things you have seen. Do you see that? That's chapters one, the things that you have seen. So John got the vision, you could read it for yourself, that's the things you have seen. Then chapter two through three, that's the seven churches, it says next, that, that, that are, the things that are, those that are, that, that's chapter two and three. Then the rest of the book is written to the things that, that that those that are to take place after this, that's chapter four through 22. So the things that are to take place in Naperville, in Wheaton where I just was and preached, in Romeoville and all over, in the churches and in our world. So that's Revelation. And what's unique about this letter, intro message, good stuff? intro message. So let me show you the, this is what each letter follows the same. F oh, okay. We'll go here first. Let's stay here. These are the letters and the titles. And so you can see today's is Dear Careless Church. Next week, Dear Courageous Church. Dear Compromising Church. Dear Corrupt Church. Dear Complacent Church. Dear Committed Church. Dear Comfortable Church. Laodicea. Had to find a lot of C words. But that's where we're going. And then each of the open letters has like this similar format, which you're gonna see this, so I wanna show it to you at the front end. So it's like, dear, fill in the church name. And, and it's a pronouncement to proclaim, that's the opening. Then there's a praise. Hey, you guys are awesome at this. And, and then there's a problem. So all seven letters have a pronouncement. Six of the letters have a praise. Five of the letters have a problem and a plan to improve. Seven of the letters have a promise to claim. This one we have has all of them. And then you like my signature? Do you know how people write? They write, like I do that sometimes, in Christ. Have you ever done that? In Christ. End, end of a letter. Nobody in the first row has done that. Thank you for being religious and sanctimonious <laughs> and loving the Lord like me. I don't know the rest of them, but, but I just put... Jesus writes, in me, Jesus Christ. I thought that was really creative, and you guys are like, you know. So that's the letters. So let's jump right in, letter number one. Are you ready? Look with me at verse one of chapter two. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. You say, man, that's a lot of analogies. It's picturesque, it's prophetic, we'll get to it. Verse two, here's the praise. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with the things that are evil, but you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, 
and found them to be false. I know you're, you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not gone weary, grown weary. Here's the problem, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Just as a sideline, anybody named Nick, just out of curiosity, just raise your hand. I knew you wouldn't do it now. But in all seriousness, we don't know what the Nicolaitans did. The Bible doesn't tell us. But isn't it true that there's some things that we can do that Jesus doesn't like? And so he's calling them out. And then he says next, in verse 7, Here's how it ends. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat at the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Father, I pray for your blessing on this series, for us as individuals, for us as families, for us as a collection of local churches, for the churches in our area, for the churches in our world. May you be glorified. May you speak. May you use this letter as a plea to change our attitudes and our actions. If you agree with that, say amen. Okay, so here we go. Here's the pronouncement to proclaim. You can see it right here, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. So angel can be used, the Greek word can be an earthly or a heavenly messenger. That's what the word angel means, it's a messenger. So in this context, it's an earthly messenger. The angel of the church is the pastor, the location pastor. Craig, you are an angel in so many ways. And in so many ways, he's not. But no, kidding. Like, that's what it's written. It's written to the pastors. In our context, it'd be senior pastor. It'd be the pastors, like, of the church, the leaders. And so to the angel of the church in Ephesus, we have a map. And so this is where the church was. You can see it in Ephesus is the map, that it's a seaport city. And so that's where the other seven are. This is the water. And so as a seaport city, it had had four roads that went out and a lot of goods would come in. So think, I don't know, New York and San Francisco. It's just like they're taking in a lot. It was a wealthy city. The church was started by the Apostle Paul in the later chapter of Acts. You can read that. Priscilla and Aquila helped get it going. Um, Timothy was their pastor for a while. They had a 40-year rich history. The apostle John, who wrote the letter of Revelation, was an elder in the church, man. They had great stock, man, people that were in that church. And so that's where the church was. Looks next, it says the words of him, that's Jesus. He's the one writing this, in Christ, in me. And then he says, who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Again, it's picturesque. It's poetic. I'm left-handed, so I'm holding my left hand. We have a tendency to hold the hand up, which we are. So imagine Jesus holding up the seven stars in his right hand. First thing we know, Jesus is (laughs) right-handed. That makes sense, doesn't it? Second thing we know is, who are the stars? Well, Revelation 1 verse 20 tells us that that's the pastor. Those are the pastors. And so he's upholding the seven stars. And now, I never thought of myself as a star. <laughs> but who am I to argue with Jesus? And now that you're laughing, it says there's seven golden lampstands. That's you, Revelation 1 verse 20. So you're not silver in Jesus' mind. You're not brown, bronze in Jesus' mind. You're gold. And so what does it say that Jesus is doing? He's holding the seven stars, and somebody, what's he doing? He, he's walking. He's walking amongst the seven golden landstands, the churches, and he knows what's going on with you at work and all the pressure you feel. He, he knows what's going on with you guys. Man, it's so good to see you guys. This is a, co- a family that started with us in the high school. So good to see you back. He knows where you've been the last 15 years. I don't. I'm kidding. <laughs> But, but he, he, he's walking around the church, and I, I don't care if you can't see me or not, just in the dark. Like, like, he knows what's going on in the back rows here. 
Where's your husband? Is he here? He was here. Jesus knows exactly where he is right now. And he knows what's going on in the back row, man. Brother, thank you for coming, being here. Love you, man. If I was coming to this church, I'd be sitting right next to you in the last row so nobody could see me. But, but he knows everything about what's happening. He's not some owner thinking NFL. He's not some NFL owner who's sitting up in a skybox somewhere. No, he's on the field. He's like Jerry Jones, but in a good way. He, 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 he's on the field with the team. He's not some for the business people in the room. He's not some silent partner who you wonder, oh, I wonder where, who is that guy or, or who's funding this project? Who are those people? He, he's, he's right here with us. I, I don't know about you, but that brings comfort. He, he knows what we're struggling with. And as I foolishly just walk around, and I, I mean, I love you guys. I, he, he loves you more. I, I love the fact that you're wearing that Bears shirt. <laughs> Let's kneel down and pray as a church <laughs> in this moment for Jesus to do something because I can't. We'll see. We'll see is right. Uh, but isn't it true? He knows the difficulties that we face. He's with us. Amen? His, his presence is felt. So what comes next? Well, on the screen, next point. He wants to praise. And so he praises them for what does he praise them for? I don't even need to look. There's fourfold praise. It's for the works, what they were doing. It's not only for their works, but it was for their toil. So it was not what they were doing, it was how they were doing it. They were giving their all, their blood, sweat, and tears, man. He was, they were giving everything. And then he says that what? He praises them for their patient endurance. And so patient endurance, it's two words here in our English Bibles, comes from two Greek words compound that are put together, one under the other. It's like to remain, remain and under, put together, to remain under. So it's like despite the pressure that comes in your life, that, that, that the, it's coming down at work and all the things that are happening and your senior pastor is stronger than I thought <laughs> and it's choking you. It, and, and what most people like to do, just be honest, when, when the pressure comes down, what is it? You tell me, let's, we're smart church. They break. Yeah, they break or they, they run, right? They, they cut and run, they bail. And, and so this is, he's praising them for the fact that they would not cut and run. They would not bail. Man, I'm telling you, they were there for their families. The, there's no deadbeat dads. The, the husbands, it was like, you know, they weren't running out on their wives. It, it's like they were, they were remaining under the pressure in their jobs. It, do you know that this is known, this particular church, that this area, they were known, they had the temple of Diana, which you could see this in your study Bibles. And the temple of Diana, what that was, was people would come from all over, and it, she was the goddess of fertility. So if you want to have a baby and you couldn't, you come to Ephesus, and, and people would worship there. It was one of the seven wonders in the, of the ancient world. And, and so people are coming from the culture with all kinds of things, and they are, they are feeling the pressure. I don't know about you, but do you feel the pressure in the church of our culture just kind of coming in? that they were under. And they're not gonna bail on truth, they're not gonna bail on what the Bible says, they're not gonna bail on this at all. No, they're gonna remain under the pressure. And then I love this, at the end he says, and they had some false teachers, some people who were claiming to be apostles that weren't. And then it says that, that what? The last thing is that, I love this because he says, you've been bearing up patiently for my name's sake and you've not grown weary. Hey, did you know that I don't care what the name of our church is? Did you realize that? I mean, I really don't care. I mean, High Point Church, it's kind of cool. I like the logo. I like when they give me water, and I like when it has the little logo on it, but I don't care about a church logo. 
because I'm in it for Jesus. You with me? I don't care what the name of the church was. I was just at the church in, in Wheaton, and it was called First Baptist, and whatever the church name, I don't care. It's for the name of Jesus, for the fame of his name. That's why we're doing what we're doing, man. That's why we're investing. That's why we're applauding the Lord for starting two new works. Did you realize it's the first anniversary for High Point in St. Charles and High Point in Hinsdale? This is the first anniversary that, man, praise the Lord. Your limitless giving and ye stepped out in faith are able to fund these new ministries that, that we can gain ground for the gospel. And, and so, just like they were in it for the fame of his name, that's why I'm in it. And that's why I know you're in it too. So, so he was applauding them for all of that. But, but you know there's gotta be a problem, right? Like, it can't be perfect. There's no perfect church because there's no perfect people, even though the pastor's a star. <laughs> uh, he's far from perfect. More pastors need to admit it. And, 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 and what, is, what does he say? He says, I have this against you, that you've abandoned your first love. Okay, have a little fun for a moment. Who remembers their first love? Oh my gosh, you raised your hand. Don't do that if you're married right now. <laughs> now somebody's pointing, it was him. Was it him? Love at first sight? Nah, eh, that's what she said. <laughs> she just literally said, eh. How are you feeling right now? Let's just talk about that. <laughs> he gave a thumbs up. I remember my first love, because I married her. And I remember Jody sitting over here, and Jody, I remember when you, in Curlin High School, asked me to that Sadie Hawkins dance right in front of that water fountain. She thought I wouldn't be caught dead at a Sadie Hawkins dance, but I'll do anything for you, girl. <laughs> I'll go anywhere. And, and, and so they forgot their first love. I, I've been through this passage before, and one of the phrases that pops up in my own mind is, and I think it might be worthy of writing down, is I think what the real problem was, their duty displaced their devotion. So, so their duty, what, what they were doing displaced their emotion. If they thought that Jesus was up in the corner like clapping and praising them like, whoa, man, you guys are awesome and that's fantastic and for what they were doing. But he had his head down and he was, for how they were doing it. Do you see the difference? It, it wasn't what they were doing. It was how they were doing it that mattered. So our attitudes fuel our actions. So our motives are very important. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it for a pat on the back? Is it to be recognized? No, their duty had displaced their devotion. And so that was the problem. And so I've got an illustration here. Hopefully this will help. So imagine if, if I'm this cup in and of myself, I'm empty. I got nothing to give. If God's this huge, imagine huge, gigantic pitcher to fill, what does God do? He, he fills me. And, and so now I've got something to give. And, and so let's just imagine for a moment that you're these little small cups. I'm really big, you're small, sorry. I took these, I didn't have cups, so I took these from the health club this morning where I was. <laughs> They're the mouthwash cups, and I just took a bunch of them. I just said, hey, you taking those? Yeah, need those. <laughs> Thought of this illustration today. It's a good one, isn't it? So go ahead, take a cup, and just go ahead. You guys pass it down. Take, pass it down. So that's what you guys are. And each week, what I do, yeah, I definitely give one to him. He's not feeling good. He's already feeling left out. <laughs> And so what I do each week is, is what happens is, I mean, during the week, I get tossed and I turned and I'm, I'm full, but man, it, it I, like, I just, I, I just, yeah, anybody feel like that? You get filled with God and, and or your duty, it, it, it just, it just, your devotion, man. And then what I do is I come here and I'm just so generous that I just pour out. And you say, why are you spilling it? Because I'm so generous. I'm just willing to give. I'm just willing to give. I'm just willing to give. This is the Holy Spirit water. Why are you so worried about getting it on you? 
and I, I, just, I just give. See, she's not worried. She loves the Lord. I don't know about you guys. And, and we just give, and we just give, and, and I feel like I'm just trying to give so much. I mean, you, need, you actually need a little bit more. And then I'm telling you this, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to get it on your, your jeans. And then, you know what? You just need so much. We're just going to give. I just feel like I got to empty on you right now. I just got to empty. But then where's that leave me? And, and so what do we need to do? I mean, that foolish illustration, isn't it? But, but isn't it true? That, that, that I have nothing to give, and so you, thank you for your participation in the front row. Next week, you won't be sitting there, and we'll be handing out some plastic stuff. I, I gotta get refilled. And so for us to be the husband that I wanna be, and the father I wanna be, and the parent you wanna be, and the servant you wanna be, and the person at your workplace, I mean, I, I got to be full. And so that's the problem, is the duty displaced the devotion. Now, how do we fix it? What, what do you think, guys? How, how can we fix that? I don't really care how you think we should fix it. Because the answer's in the text. And so look with me next at the verse, because now it's the plan to improve I'm going to give you three R words. Two of them are in the text. The plan to improve is first R word. Do you see it? Do you see it in verse five? What is it? Somebody tell me. It's remember. So we got to remember from where we have fallen. We got to remember that mountaintop experience with God. You got to remember it was like, I don't know if it was your baptism. I don't know if it was that missions trip that you went on. And that mission trip was like, oh my goodness, like, like, I can't believe it, and you learned so much, and I gave them more than they gave me. Excuse me, other way around. I, I, I didn't hardly give them anything. They gave me everything. I helped build this thing, this, dug this hole in this. But they're the ones that filled me. I don't know, maybe it's that time at the campfire where you threw the log in, and you said, I'm going to give it to him, and I'm going to give my life to him. Like he's just saying, just remember that mountaintop experience. How did it feel? What were the circumstances? Like too often we forget. So we've got to remember from where we have fallen from. And then second R word, that one's pretty easy to see. It's two times we see it, repent. And so repent, it's used two times here. It's used eight times in the letters if you count it up, seven letters. It's used... 12 times in the book of Revelation, nearly 50 times in the New Testament. What does it mean? Greek word metanoia simply means to agree with God. That I would agree with God with what I'm doing is wrong. And, and so it implies that your attitude is going to change your action. And so it's, I always call it a U-turn on the highway of life. Any military in here? Who's a military person? Don't be bashful. Anybody? Nobody, huh? No military. Well, the military, if you were, you, you'd know what, you know what an about face is, right? An about face is, that's what repentance is. The reason I asked if there was any military, because every time I do that illustration, they're like, they come up to me after, like, well, you did it wrong. You didn't do it right. I know. That's why I asked you to stand up and I would have had you do it. <laughs> but but it's, it's the change of direction. And so D.L. Moody, I love what he said. He called repentance a tear in the eye of faith. That, that's repentance. And so we need to repent. Third, our word, not in the text, but I think it's implied. Do the works you did at first. So we're to return we're to redo the works we once did. I was in the lobby a couple weeks ago and I saw a guy I had never seen him before. It was his first time to our church, young adult. And he said, um, I haven't been to church in six years. And he literally was crying. 
And, and I told you, you got to go to, you know, young adult groups, meets on Thursday. I'm like, uh, you know, you, you, you got to go to our men's thing. We got this big men's blowout that's happening in September on the 25th. And we're getting all the men in our church. We're going to gather four times this year. I'm calling all men rally at High Point Church. We want to invest in you. September 25th, it's a Sunday night. We want to rally you. Please. If you're a man, would you please come? It's really important because we want to do this for our church and it starts with us is that we would remember, we would repent, and we would redo the works we once did. For this guy, he was like, yeah, I used to be in this group and there were really these guys that helped me and that was my mountaintop experience and I just have been so far from Christian fellowship. He's on an island, man. And have you ever felt like that? And so redo the things you once did, whether that's time in the word, whether that's getting what a great time to start in the fall. It's here, we got groups starting, all kinds of groups. Redo the works that you once did. And so we're gonna remember, we're gonna repent, we're gonna redo. At the end of the service, left some time for communion. So communion is a time for us to declare our love for God because we may have forgotten our first love, but our first love never forgets us. And so communion is a time of confession. And so there's stations. I'll just give you the instructions now. You go to the station and you get the cup and you go back to your seat and you take that and you do what it says in verse five. I don't want to do that. I don't want to get involved. I just want to be a consumer. Well, that's is the problem here. If that happens to all of us, then it says you're going to remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. God's saying, I'm going to remove my presence. Jesus has left the building. 4,500 churches close every year. Jesus leaves the building. Sometimes he needs to leave the building. He's like, I don't want to be here. Anybody know any churches like that? They close and they die. I don't want that here. So we gotta, we gotta be committed like this church to remembering and repenting and redoing the things. Man, that's the Christian life. And then, so lastly, we've got this at the end here, a promise. And, and I love this promise because it says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that's a common phrase that Jesus uses a lot in the Gospels. So he's, it's about hearing and heeding. Are you hearing and heeding the message that Jesus has for you today? Is your duty displacing your devotion and causing you to not have any delight in him? Just rolling up your sleeve and working for him? And then he uses this phrase, he says, I will grant you to eat at the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And so paradise of God, it's rarely used in the New Testament, but every time you see paradise, it's a picture of heaven. And so eat at the tree of life is Genesis, we see it the first time. We don't see it anywhere for the rest of the Bible until Revelation right here. And at the end of Revelation, in Revelation 2, the first time, we see the tree of life is in the garden in Genesis, and we know what happened there is that they got kicked out of the garden for their sin, repentance. And then the last time we see it's here in Revelation that Jesus paid for our sin and we get to eat at the tree of life in the paradise of God. That's what we're looking to. It says we're conquerors. We don't conquer anything in and of ourselves. We conquer, that's genuine faith. We conquer things through him. And so the tree of life is a picture of the intimacy and the fellowship that we have with God that can start right now and it'll go on for eternity. I mean, that's the promise. Is that awesome? That, that's the promise of God that you can have fellowship and intimacy with him r right now in the midst of your circumstance. I'm gonna call the worship team forward and we're gonna move into a time of communion as 
as they kind of prepare our hearts, I'm just going to ask you to stand. And so as we prepare our hearts for communion, which is an opportunity for us to take the bread, which was Jesus' body that was broken, and take the cup, which the cup is representative of the blood that was shed. And so you're gonna, when you feel led, don't rush this time as Ethan and the team plays over us, is, is you're gonna go to one of the stations nearest you, you're gonna take it back and I wonder if at your seat, maybe with you and your spouse or you as a family, that, that you would pray those three R's for you, for your family, and for our church. That Isaiah's the one, he's like, you know what? He confessed the sins of the people and that we would start this series. What a great way to start in the fall, right? With, with let's just confess to him. And so as the team's gonna start playing in a moment, I, I was thinking about this, because um, Jody and I, we were on a bike ride yesterday, and we love riding bikes, maybe you're like us, and we go on the prairie path, and, and when our kids were small, I mean, I basically forced them to ride the bike, sorry, that's the dad I was. And, and, and they liked it, you know, they all became athletic, and, and I remember this one time, we, I was just reminded of it yesterday, because we rode right by the spot, and I looked back, and, and our middle daughter, Erin, like, like she's way behind, she's way far back. And I'm just like, this isn't her, like her, you know? It's like the other one, but no, I'm kidding. It's not like her, she's usually right up there with us. And, and so, you know, I, I, as a good dad, I circled back, and I, I, I got all the way back there, and she's pedaling and sweating, and, and she, her tire was flat. Somehow the air had gone out of the tire. We were 15 miles into a 25 mile bike ride and it was literally fat and she was still gritting it out, wasn't complaining, wasn't saying anything. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I think that's the picture of some of us in the church. We're just working real hard, man. We're just trying to make it happen. We're trying to be the people that God's called us to be. We're trying to quit that habit and start something new. We're trying to serve. And, and we're just... We're working really hard. But, but in my foolish illustration, we, we need him to pump us up. We need that water to fill our cups so that we can give to others. We need the wind behind our sails that, that we don't want to violate John chapter 15, verse 5, that, that I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches, and so you are to abide in him. Why? Because that's what brings fruit. And so let's take this time in this communion to let him fill us, to let him lead us, to let him guide us. Father, I pray for your spirit to lead. I pray for your spirit to guide. Respond as you feel led.